Will you remain standing just for a moment with us? Thank you, worship team. Brother Ricardo, ladies and men, thank you for the anointing upon your life. Wow, so good to be in God's presence, isn't it? We're grateful that you're here tonight. I want to just take a moment. It's just right. The Bible says that you're to give honor to whom honors do. And I, I would just like to take a moment to tell you how blessed you already know that you are to have a pastor and his wife like Pastor Tim and Cindy. I love the man. We are friends. But can I say this to you, that Pastor Tim has been more than a friend to me as well. He has really spoken into my life numerous times. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was wrestling with a decision that had to be made, and I called Pastor Tim, and I said, Pastor, speak into my life, and he said, you know, Brad, the word of the Lord says the steps of the righteous man are ordered of the Lord, but I feel like I'm to tell you the stops of the righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And he said, just keep walking and keep moving forward regarding that situation. And if the Lord ever stops you, you'll know that was his stop. It was like Solomon said in the Proverbs. He said, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. It was just the right word for my life. And I thank the Lord for Pastor Delina, Sister Cindy. They're just beautiful people. I, I'm in Detroit. I'm their number one fan. I, uh, I thought about, and I need to, I'll send to Pastor Tim and Cindy a, a gift card or something, and Amy for all the arrangements she's helped put together. But I thought about every time I go to speak somewhere outside of my church, I take the 260 journey. And the, the book, Pastor Delina's book, and I thought, you know what, I think he's already got a copy. <laughs> but it's, it's just um, a blessing. My wife and I read it every morning. We did today. I was walking out of the church, on our church on Sunday, and then new man, Ron, had been water baptized recently. He said, Pastor, I want to thank you for encouraging me. I'm on day 30 of the 260 journey. I said, just keep going, brother. And I just say, Pastor Delina, thank you for your life. Thank you for your friendship. <laughs> and I have to say, uh, I'm blessed. I walked in tonight, and uh, I looked across the sanctuary, and my college roommate is here with his wife from Baltimore. They passed her in Baltimore. They were here last week. Brother Kendall preached last week, and then Pastor Ed, Michael, and his wife, Rachel, her family, they passed her outside the New York City area. You made my night coming with your two beautiful kids. Ed and Rachel, we love you dearly. Thank you for being here. So this is Thanksgiving week. Before we read the scripture, I want to tell a story Pastor, to Pastor Delina that uh, my dad sent to me, Pastor Tim. Pastor Tim and I were both mentored by my biological dad, but he was our spiritual dad. And... Uh, my dad sent me this a while back about Thanksgiving week. A man in Phoenix called his son in New York City two days before Thanksgiving and says, I hate to ruin your day, son, but I tell you that your mother and I are getting a divorce. 45 years of misery is enough. Pop, what are you talking about, the son screamed. We can't stand the sight of each other any longer, the father said. We're sick of each other, and I'm sick of talking about this. So you call your sister in Chicago and tell her. Frantic, the son calls his sister, who explodes on the phone. There is no way on this green earth they're getting divorced, she shouts. I'll take care of this, she calls Phoenix to her dad immediately and screams at her dad, you are not getting divorced, don't do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back, we'll both be there tomorrow, until then, don't do a thing, do you hear me? And she hangs up. 
The father hangs up the phone and turns to his wife and said, okay, great news, they're both coming for Thanksgiving. <laughs> and they're paying their own way. <laughs> I'd like you to take your Bibles with us tonight. If uh, your family's not gathered around, uh, gathering for Thursday, you might want to try that. I don't know. Take your Bibles and turn with us to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. Matthew, chapter 17. I want to ask you tonight, and I'll talk about the phrase that we'll use at the close, but I want to ask you, are you a big, big godder? Are you a big God? Are you living today, Times Square Church, folks watching around the world, thank you for your, Times Square Church, your world impact. You have, I don't have the perspective, Pastor Delina probably doesn't have it fully, but you set the pace for Christendom around the world. It's true. Thank you for your impact. But I ask you tonight, are you living in the supernatural or are you living in the superficial? Are you a big godder? Currently, do you live in the superficial, just going through the motions, or are you seeing the supernatural happen in your life? I believe it's a season that we can see the supernatural. There's a lady, she's the wife of uh, the chief justice in our county, Vivian Hattie. She's married to the Honorable Judge Michael Hattie in Brighton, Michigan. She was diagnosed, the doctors gave her six months to live, Vivian, her second brain mass. When the oncologist, after we fasted and prayed and believed together, when the oncologist came out, the oncologist came out to the judge and said, you know what, I never give good news. But I'm here to tell you, a miracle has happened in your wife. That brain mass, that tumor that was there, it's no longer there. The judge said, Pastor, I'm skeptical because I hear con men all the time. But God has worked a miracle in my wife. I want to ask you tonight, is there a situation that is overwhelming you? A marriage falling apart. A prognosis from a doctor that's not favorable. A biological clock that is ticking, if you will. A financial debt that seems insurmountable and it's, it's just bearing down on you and, and only, the only result looks like bankruptcy. A situation concerning your family. A son or a daughter that's away from God. And if you were really to take a look at the circumstances, you would say, you know what, the odds are overwhelmingly against me. Can I just say this to you today? I'll say it a couple of different times, I'm sure. You know what, I'm thankful that our Lord doesn't check with Vegas or the actuary scientists about what the odds are if something's going to happen. If he speaks it, it's going to happen. I do believe that. And the great, there's a great question that's offered twice within the word of God. It's first offered in Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, and then it's followed up and it's offered in Jeremiah 32, verse 27. And it's an interesting question because it's not asked of God, it's not asked about God, it's not asked to God, it is asked by God. Say by God. The word of the Lord is this. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Jeremiah heard it. The word of the Lord came to him in Jeremiah 32. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? And he already knew the answer, verse 17. Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power an outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Again, whatever you're facing, you know what? Our Lord doesn't check with the pundits, the odds makers, the handicappers. 
You know, the Detroit Lions, if you have to wonder if there's miracles happening, look at the Lions record this year, okay? I mean, the fact is, when they were playing this past week, they were down 12 points with four minutes to go, and ESPN, they, I don't know where they get it from, but they put up, there's a 98.2% chance Detroit loses, but Detroit won. But can I tell you, it doesn't matter what the odds are against you and I. When we're his children, he wants to sovereignly provide for us. He wants to throw open heaven's windows and bring forth a blessing to your heart and my life, and all we have to do is receive it and be obedient tonight. Now, I want to read a story that's just four verses. And if you just are reading the word of God, you can almost gloss over the story, but it's one of my favorites And I want to just ask you tonight, are you living, serving a big God, or are you living in the superficial or the supernatural? Let's read this passage. The background is, Jesus has been on the Mount of Transfiguration. He is uh, is there with Moses and Elijah. Peter says, can we just stay here? They go down into the valley. The Lord casts the demon out of a boy. And uh, the Lord speaks to those disciples because they said, why, is, why didn't it happen for us? And he said, this kind cometh out only by fasting and prayer. And then they go to Capernaum, and that's where we pick it up. Verse number 24 of Matthew 17. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was first to speak. I want you to see that, Times Square Church. Say, first to speak. Jesus was first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked. From who do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not offend them, go to the lake, Throw out your line. Say, throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Lord, thank you for Pastor Tim and Cindy. Thank you for this church that is making an amazing impact on our world, and they set the pace for others of us. Bless them. Bless them at this Christmas season, Lord. Bless them at this Thanksgiving season. Lord, would you just pour out your spirit? Give us the overflow of what you do here in New York City that people would take notice. There is a God that is alive and well. Pray, Lord, just what we saw. Almost 200 people baptized. To you be the glory and the praise. Would you just increase it, Lord? All glory and honor and praise will go to you. I know the Delinas, I know the elders of the church, I know this body. Lord, just bless them immensely. And in these next few moments, Lord, would you just speak to people's hearts and lives? Maybe they've come in burdened tonight. Maybe they've become overwhelmed and the odds are seemingly insurmountable. But Lord, would you let faith just arise in this place? I pray, Lord, you just do a great work. And if you can't speak through me, speak in spite of me to these people that you and I love tonight. In Jesus' awesome and mighty name. And everybody would say amen. 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 You may be seated. Shortly after the miracle of the demon being cast out of the boy, Jesus comes into Capernaum. You heard it. And the people began to ask, the skeptics began to ask, you know what, hey, what's going to happen about that two drachma tax that you're supposed to pay, you Jews are supposed to pay to keep the temple upkept or the upkeeping of it? Jesus asked Peter, you know what, as a son, are we exempt? He said, yes, we're exempt, the Lord said to him. But he said there in verse 27, So we don't offend them. Go down to the lake, throw out your line. The first fish that you catch, open its mouth, you're gonna find a stater. 
a four drachma coin there. I love the painting that uh, you see tonight. It's a painting by Peter Paul Rubens from the 17th century. It's just entitled Peter Extracting the Tax. And I, I love it because it's an amazing story of God's divine provision for Peter. And in this simple message tonight, I want to ask you, would you leave here tonight believing God for great things in your life? If you've come in and you need a miracle, I want you to know we serve a miracle-working God. That's not hype. That's not just verbiage. We serve a God that will move heaven and earth on our behalf. I believe that tonight. So I want to give you just quickly, if you've got your phone and you want to jot it down or you've got a piece of paper, and you want to jot it down, I want you to remember four things when you need a miracle. Remember four facts about our Lord when you ask God to do the miraculous in your life. Number one is this. Remember God's omniscience. God's omniscience. God knows our needs before we ask him. Notice there again in verse 25, when Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. They were outside and asked Peter the question, but when he walked through the door, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? The tax support is talked about. If you're taking notes, jot it down. Exodus chapter 30, verse 13. It was so that the Jews could keep the temple up. The Romans allowed it. But the fact is, Jesus was, wasn't outside. He was inside. But he heard the conversation as the living God, and he wanted Peter to realize that he has a super knowledge, supernatural knowledge of this need even before he asks. I would submit to you. Maybe you're like me. Sometimes I, I think the purpose of prayer is sometimes to inform God of my need. But the word says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, the Father knows what we need before we even ask. Amen. The purpose of prayer is not to inform God concerning the things that are happening in our lives. We pray because our prayers make a difference. You coming to the prayer meeting tonight, calling on the name of the Lord for your family, for your people, for those around about you. The fact is, some things will only take place as God's people pray. Some things are only going to happen unless we pray. It was interesting, Pastor Tim. I've already sent this document to Amy the, with the text. And in my devotions this morning from my YouVersion Bible is this quote from Watchman Nee. And I had already sent the exact quote. I was like, that's a confirmation for me at least. Look what he said. Our prayers lay the track down on which God's power can come. Like a mighty locomotive, his power is irresistible, but it cannot reach us without rails. Prayer's the rails that brings the supernatural power of God to your life and my life, believer. Next year, great seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary is gonna celebrate in their, in their existence 100 years of existence. And uh, it initially, the first year, almost got shut down in 1924. President Lewis Sperry Schaefer, on the left, called the faculty together one morning. And because the creditors were knocking at the door, they were going to shut down the school at noon. Uh, a theologian, Pastor Delina, would know, Pastor Michael would know, others would know, uh, was on staff, he was a, a professor, his name was Dr. Harry Allen Ironside. And they were having a prayer meeting in the president's office, gathered around in a circle saying, Lord, would you do a miracle? When it came to Dr. Ironside, Dr. Ironside prayed Psalm 50, verse 10. He said, Lord, we know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Please sell some of the cattle and send us the money. True story. Just then a Texas businessman stepped into the seminary's business office and said, 
I just sold two train car loads of cattle in Fort Worth, and I feel compelled to give the money to the seminary. I don't care if you need it or not, here's the check. The surprise, the surprise secretary took the check timidly in and knocked at the president's door and interrupted the prayer meeting. And Dr. Schaefer took the check out of her hand and discovered it was for the exact amount of the debt the seminary was in. He then turned to Dr. Ironside and said, Harry, God sold the cattle. <laughs> what are the odds of that happening? Without God, one in multiple billions. But with God, the odds change to one in one. Because you and I don't have to completely understand it, Times Square Church. Doesn't mean that if we don't understand it, God's not gonna do it. When I was here 18 months ago, I read that passage from Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Somebody said it, I'm not sure who it was, but me trying to understand God's ways is sort of like me trying to explain to an ant how the internet works. It's just way beyond us. But the fact of the matter is, he's able to do far above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works within us. So it's, say omniscience. Remember, God is all-knowing. He knows what our needs are before we ask. He knows exactly what you're facing right now. Number two, when you need a supernatural miracle, remember God's omnipotence. God controls events that you can't control. Did you see it there? So that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line, Jesus said. I love what John Mason said. He said, always involve yourself in, with something bigger than you are because that's where God is. And Jesus reveals to Peter, church, that he already knew his need, and Jesus told him, go out and throw out your line. And when he caught the first fish, he would take that coin inside its mouth with which to pay the tax. Now think about it, church. Of all the ways that Jesus could have chosen to meet Peter and his need, why did he choose this way? Aren't there easier ways to get money? I mean, Jesus could have said, hey, we need some money. Would you pay our tax so we don't offend? Could somebody give a free will offering? Of course, there's multiple ways that Jesus could have asked or received that money. Peter could have received it. But the reason Jesus did it this way, in my opinion, was he wanted to demonstrate to Peter and to us, because we're studying it even here thousands of years later, that he controls events that we can't control. Peter was most likely thinking what? Hey, Jesus, do you remember where you called me from? This was my livelihood. This was my gig. I know how to catch fish. Remember, I had a fishing business with Dad. And the best way to catch fish, Lord, to, to get as many as you can is not with a line, it's with a net. If you want volume, it's a net we ought to use. And Peter was right. It is easier to catch fish with a net than it is with a hook. But Jesus didn't want Peter to catch a whole net of fish. He just wanted him to catch the right one, the one with the, the coin in its mouth. Did I lose power? Okay, sorry about that. The Lord wanted Peter to realize, I control events you don't, you don't even know about. If you're a single individual here today, you might be asking yourself, you know, how in the world am I going to meet Miss Wright or, Mrs. R or Mr. Wright among seven billion people in the world? You know what? How, how am I going to do that? Can I just say to you, you don't need to meet seven billion people. You just need to meet the right one. All you need is the right one at the right place at the right time. And if God can lead a fish to a man, he can lead a woman to a man. 
Thousands of, of fish are swimming in the Sea of Galilee, but Peter didn't need to catch all of them. He only needed to catch the one with the coin in its mouth. And so what are the odds of that one fish with the one coin in its mouth catching that little hook? Without God, maybe one in a billion or multiple billion again? With God, it's one in one. Peter had no control over the fish he was going to catch. All he could do was hold out the fishing pole and trust what God had said to him. And God made sure the right fish would bite on Peter's hook. Have you thought about, I was thinking about flying in to meet Pastor Tim. How the Lord just orchestrated his life and we just rejoice. You know, a, a young man, Christian down, Baylor Baptist. He hasn't been to Detroit. Comes to Detroit to help plant a church, church in the city with Pastor Mike. God calls him and people like my dad and the elders get on board with Pastor Delina and Roosevelt Hunter. God plants an amazing church in Highland Park, right in the heart of the city of Detroit for 25 plus years. Then takes him to Louisiana before bringing him here. Only a great God. Only a great God. And I want you to know the fact of the matter is for you and I, have you thought about how God has orchestrated your life? When Ron and I, Pastor Tim will tell you, when we planted the church in the fall of 1992, we were a, a year or two behind Pastor Delina. And when we planted that church, they just parachuted us in. We didn't have two nickels to rub together. We didn't have any property. We had a, a quorum of like 12 people to start this church. The youngest was like 68 or 70 years old. He was the youth pastor. <laughs> pastor Ed would call me every Monday. You hanging in there, man? You hanging in there? But my wife had always wanted to teach school. And pastor Delina can tell you that Metro Detroit doesn't have the population of New York by any stretch, but it just spread out. It, from one side of the metropolitan area to the other side, it'll take you an hour and a half to get there. And my mother-in-law knew that her daughter wanted to teach school to help us start the church. And when she would drive from one side of the city to the other side, to Rochester, Michigan, from Farmington Hills, she would drive by on 14-mile road, and she would stretch out her hand every morning, and she would say, Lord, would you just provide Rhonda a teaching job in a school like that? When we got the call from a principal, a principal had taken the back part of an envelope and just written down, wrote down Rhonda's name. No resume, just Rhonda Trask and the phone number. Called three days before the school year started after we had just started the church at nine months earlier and said, we have a job waiting for you if you, if you want to take it right now. It had health benefits. It was making twice as much money as the church could ever pay us there. It was just what God had planned. Now let me just say this to you. Of all the five and a half million people in Metro Detroit, what school do you think it was that the principal called and asked for Rhonda to teach middle school at that school? That school on 14 Mile, halfway across the city of Detroit, but that was the exact school my mother-in-law would stretch out her hand to pray over. God controls events that we can't control. He knows what we have need of before we ask. Thirdly, if you're taking notes, just jot this down. Remember, not only is omnipotence, is omniscience, but remember his timing is perfect. His timing is perfect. Take the first fish you catch. Just like we can misapprehend 
our Lord's thoughts and we can misunderstand his plans. We can sometimes miscalculate his timing. Can I just say this? God's never been late. Because we're so impatient. You know, I got on the flight today. Flight was supposed to leave at 12.59. And we backed out. One of the engines goes bad. And they said, you know what? We're not certain you're going to get there on time. I'm like, oh, boy. And I'm really impatient. I'm waiting there. Please, please. I've, I want to be with these people. I want to go and be, see my buddies. But, man, we in life get so impatient at times. And the fact is, God's timing is always perfect. Peter went to the sea, Times Square Church, threw out a line, and no, with no accident, that right fish at the right place at the right time was there by divine appointment for the fish to meet Peter. And I would submit to you, there are no accidents with God, only divine appointments. The ram is caught in the thicket just at the exact time Abraham's about to offer Isaac, Genesis 22. When Saul's looking for his lost donkey, he meets Samuel at the appointed time set by God, 1 Samuel 9. The arrow shot at random by the Aramean soldiers strikes wicked King Ahab in the midst of the armor joints, just as it had been prophesied, 2 Chronicles 18.33. Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem for a census at the same time she gives birth to Jesus to fulfill the prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, hundreds of years earlier. At the exact time Peter denies the Lord for the third time, the rooster in the courtyard crows, fulfilling the Lord's prophecy from Matthew 26, 74 and 75. The great fish was at the appointed spot in the ocean at the right time to catch Jonah when the men threw him overboard. Jonah chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. Not only is God in control, his timing is absolutely perfect. You see a picture of a, a man your pastor and I greatly respect. Franklin Graham is the son of evangelist Billy Graham, as you know. Let me just read a little portion from his book, When the Lights Went On. Franklin Graham was a newly licensed pilot flying from Vero Beach, Florida to Longview, Texas. And he met bad weather over Mobile, Alabama. Air traffic controllers told him to fly north toward Jackson, Mississippi to avoid the coming storm. As he rose above the clouds, the instrument panel lights flickered. A minute later, the radio and the instruments went dead. Then all the lights went out. Franklin realized the situation was desperate, so he asked God to intervene. He dropped below the clouds hoping to see the ground, and when he spotted the distant lights of Jackson, Mississippi, he headed towards the airport's rotating beacon. He circled the control tower, and since he didn't have any electrical power, he lowered the landing gear manually. At that moment, all the runways, emergency landing lights came on, and he landed. As soon as he was on the ground, the lights went off. That's odd, he thought. At least they could have waited until I taxied up to the ramp. After Franklin got out of the plane, a man from the tower asked, who gave you permission to land? No one in the tower had seen the plane circling overhead. Why would the lights have been turned on if they hadn't seen them? They investigated and discovered the runway lights had been turned on by an air traffic controller who was explaining to his visiting pastor what he would do in case a plane ever attempted to land without radio communications. At the exact moment when Franklin needed the lights, the controller turned them on without knowing the plane was there. What are the odds of that? Without God, billions to one. With God, one in one. One last idea. Remember God's omniscience. Remember God's omnipotence. Remember God's timing is always perfect. Remember God is sovereign. He rules and he reigns. And he supplies needs to those who obey him. Look what it says again. Open its mouth and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Probably a little bit bigger, a stater was, than a, a quarter. Jesus told Peter to throw out the line into the sea. It's not too difficult. 
But he, if he didn't obey, he never is going to catch the fish. And it's essential, I would submit to you, that we do our part in what God asks us to do. Peter was responsible, as far as I see it, to do two things. First off, he had to go to the right sea. Say sea. He, if he goes down to the dead sea, he's going to realize there's no fish there. And some people aren't catching any fish because they're fishing outside of God's will in the dead sea. I would submit to you, Times Square, hear me. Many times when God wants to bless your life, he will ask you to do something and it, it is incumbent upon you being obedient and the blessing comes. The priests have to step into the water while they're carrying the ark. Don't not when they get close to the water, they gotta step into the water by faith, then the water's gonna dam up. Book of Joshua. Naaman's got to dip not six times, not five times. He's got to dip seven times, and then the leprosy is going to disappear. He stops at five or six. Abraham, you know you got to leave it all. Leave it all. Just go. I'll make you into a great nation, but step out by faith. And the second thing he's got to do, Peter has to do, is throw out the line. God didn't make the fish jump into the boat. Peter had to throw out the line. And many times when God wants to provide for us, he asks us to take that step of faith. Now, Peter could have thrown out a net to try and improve his odds, go for volume, but he would have been a disobedient. Jesus specifically instructed him, throw out your line. And we've got to be, be obedient, even when it makes better sense to do it a different way. Do it the way that God says to do it. So think about it, Times Square. Peter threw out his line into the sea and waits for a nibble. Maybe he's got a piece of cork or something like that, serves as a bobber. And he sees that line just start to bob. And he calls that fish in. He opens up its mouth, and, and there is that stator in that fish's mouth. Now, can I say, the only thing that would have been a bigger miracle is if he would have opened up the mouth, and the fish would have said, ta-da. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, there it was, the right fish at the right place, at the right time, with the right amount. So as the worship team just comes back, I'd like to just give you three ideas about every spiritual, supernatural transaction. And there's three important elements that I want you to gather before we go tonight. First off, a spiritual transaction, a supernatural event in your life always starts with the word of God. Say word of God. What God promised Peter not everybody was told to go throw out the line, just Peter. And I would submit to you, get your place self in a position. What Pastor Delina and Pastor Ricardo talked about even tonight with, with Pastor Patrick. Get yourself in a position to be able to receive that word on a regular basis from God. The fact is, it was a rhema word. It wasn't a general word. It wasn't something just, uh, you know what, for all the, the body. Those are great. Those are great. But the fact of the matter is a specific word. Can I tell you, when Pastor Delina came here from Louisiana, when he had to leave the church in Detroit, Highland Park, he needed a specific word for his particular life. And the Lord wants to give you a particular word, a rhema word. Even tonight, I believe he can speak into your heart and your life. Pastor Tim, 18 months ago, I was here, and um, we spoke on the life of jo Joseph. And this past summer, in Columbus, Ohio, I was outside of our general council at the hotel. And, and there was a guy, I was talking to a pastor, just getting to know him, and while I'm talking to this pastor outside the hotel, this guy bumps me on the back, and he says, uh, hey, and he, he keeps walking down the street there. And he said, hey, 
you know what, your word at Times Square 14 months ago saved my ministry. I said, hey, hey, come on, come on back here a second, bro. I did. Who are you? He said, you know, on that Tuesday night, about 5 o'clock, I decided, I'm going to church tonight. He pastors, his name is Destin Morris. D, not Dustin, Destin Morris. He said I could use this illustration. Destin said he was in New York City, and he was ready to leave the ministry, pastoring in Meridian, Mississippi. When we were preaching on Joseph, and it, I gotta tell you this, side, sidebar. He said, when I got to church and I heard you were preaching, it wasn't Pastor Tim, I was so disappointed. <laughs> I said, bro, I was disappointed too. I would have loved to have heard him. But he said, when I settled in, God had me there by divine appointment. When we preached on Joseph being faithful, even in the dungeon, Pastor Delina came up to pray in closing, and he, I remember it. He used the illustration, you know what? God can take you from being in an orange jumpsuit in jail, and he can make you the, the assistant prime minister in just a moment of time. You can trust him. And he said, when Pastor Delina prayed after you gave that word, there was faith that arose in my heart and my life. He said, our church has tripled in size. I'm never leaving Meridian, Mississippi. That was a divine moment that night. So say it with me. The word of God. Say the will of the person. Peter chose to follow God's plan. You got to believe his word and then surrender by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is your choice. The will of the person. God's never going to force you to be obedient. As we come to the holiday season, take the posture of Mary. What did she say to the angel? I'm the Lord's servant. Be it unto me as you have said. If she says, no way, I'm out. The Lord doesn't use her. But she says, I'm the Lord's servant. Tonight, the breakthrough can come in your life when you receive that word and then you respond with your will, surrender to Almighty God. And then in every spiritual transaction, there's the work of the Holy Spirit. God does what only he can do. Peter couldn't bring that fish there. Man couldn't do that. But God's appointments never disappoint. The Holy Spirit did, brought that fish to Peter as he threw out his line. Now let me just ask you this as you stand with us, would you church? And I promise we're going to respond and I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Delina in just a couple of minutes. I want to ask you a question. How do you think that coin got in that fish's mouth? Well, some people would say, well, he just spoke it into being. I don't believe that is how it happened. My, my per I believe that would make Jesus a counterfeiter. I don't believe that happened. I don't know how it happened, but maybe some fisherman had that stator and he got upset and he just decided to skip it along and into the water it began to plug down and that fish swam across to get it. Or maybe it was in his robe and it dropped out as he was bringing in a haul. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, for your life and my life, God will move heaven and earth for on our behalf to do the miraculous in our lives. So let's come full circle. Are you a big godder or a little godder? Do you believe that God is truly omnipotent, all powerful? He's able to heal your marriage, your physical needs, your finances. Can I tell you? I, I ask you just to pray. Pastor Ed and Rachel will tell you, I've got a little boy, 
we've adopted two beautiful kids. I wouldn't trade it. I shared that story with you a year and a half ago. But my son's delayed speech. I want that boy to talk clearly, cognitively. And I want him to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm believing for the miraculous in his life. Our God's able. Our God's able. And so I want to just read this to you, and we'll close. Dr. Robert Dick Wilson was a professor of Hebrew at Princeton Seminary years ago. One of his students was the man on the screen, Donald Gray Barnhouse. Pastor Tim and I, Pastor Ed, have his books. He pastored for a number of years, 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. Another great pastor, James Montgomery Boyce, pastored the church as well. But after Donald Gray Barnhouse had graduated from Princeton, he was invited back after 12 years to come back and preach at the old Miller Chapel where the alums would preach. And at the time, the former professor Dick Wilson came and sat on the front row to hear his former student. And the, the pastor, Barnhouse, said, you know, it was very intimidating to see my prof sitting there. But Dr. Barnhouse preached his heart out. And afterwards, Professor Wilson came up and extended his hand and said to Dr. Barnhouse, if you come back again, I will not come hear you preach. I only come once. I'm glad that you're a big godder. When my boys come back, I come to see if they are big godders or little godders. And then I know what their ministry will be. Pastor Barnhouse asked him to explain. Dr. Wilson said, when some men, while well, some of my men have a little God and they're always in trouble with him, he can't do any miracles. He can't take care of inspiration and transmission of scriptures. He doesn't intervene on behalf of his people. They have a little God. I call them little Godders. Then there are those who have a great God. He speaks, it's done. He commands and it stands fast. He knows how to show himself strong on behalf of those who fear him. You, Donald, have a great God and he will bless your ministry. He paused and he smiled. And he said, God bless you. Can I ask you just in closing? Are you a big godder? Or are you a little godder? If you're here tonight, Pastor Ricardo is just going to lead us in a worship song. Pastor Delina is going to come and pray over you in just a moment. But I believe that some of you are here on this Tuesday night before Thanksgiving. And faith has arose in your heart and your life that you're a big Godder. You might have come in today wondering, are the odds so against me it could never happen? I want you to know God can move heaven and earth on your behalf. If he can bring a fish to Peter with the right amount of change in its mouth, to pay a tax so men are satisfied. How much more for the child of God that is in the house tonight that needs a miracle from him? Can I just ask you? Please don't be shy. If you're here and you've got a need in your heart and your life, financially, physically, emotionally, relationally, you got kids away from God, you just say, you know what? I trust you, Lord. If that's you tonight and you believe in a big God, would you just come to the altar right now? Just step out right where you're at and meet me at this altar. You're just here and you just say, I don't know how it's going to be done. You and I don't have to worry about that. He'll take care of it. Come with a heart of expectation. Look up here one second. How many of you believe he's able? Say this with me. I believe you're able, Lord. I believe you're able. 
Say this with me. You're omnipotent. You're omniscient. Your timing is perfect. And you rule and reign over the universe. Just lift those hands unto the Lord. Would you right now just begin to praise him? Just begin to praise him. Just begin to praise him. Lord, I believe. I believe. I believe. Would you just sing this with Pastor Ricardo right now and the team? Let's just lift up a voice of praise. Lord, I believe.